that's becoming ever more complex, the need for clear thinking about all kinds of issues has become a necessity for everyone. Baroness Warnock believes that the methods of philosophy, logic and rationality can help us tackle the dilemmas we face. Dr. William Newton Smith suggests that philosophy has no necessary application, but is valuable in honing the tools of argument. Dr. Simon Blackburn is convinced that people want to hear or take part in accurate, reflective discussion of ideas. They're questioned by Paul Seagard. Simon Blackburn, what do you do for a living? I'm a philosopher. Put like that, that sounds a bit forbidding. Yes. Give me an example. What sort of thing do you actually do? Um, do you want an example of my current work or just uh, the kinds of thing that my colleagues and I do? You pick it. Okay. Um, well, I think philosophy in general is the uh, discussion of the basic conceptual apparatus, the basic conce conceptual scheme that we use to create the ideas we live by. Forgive me, that's still very esoteric and very okay. forbidding. Give um, me an example of something you actually do as a philosopher. Okay, I, d I discuss, for example, the objectivity of value. That's an interest, a question that interests me and that I've done some work on lately. Objectivity of value. Yes. People Explain that, sure. if you can, sure. in rather more simple language. If I say that there's some glasses on the table here, nobody's going to disagree. We think of that as a fact. The reason why we agree on it is that it's explained by that fact. If I say that people have rights, suddenly things become much more vague. Um, first of all, I may run into disagreement and quite serious fundamental disagreement all the way down. Well, you say that we don't argue about glasses, we uh, do argue about rights. Sure. Right. Why is that? Because um, one's abstract and the other's concrete. Or? The category is much more abstract, of course, and philosophers, I think, characteristically go for very abstract questions. When the, when the questions become more concrete and can be answered by recognized methods, they become the questions of particular sciences. Um, it's when the nature of the methods are as much in question as the um, particular issues that you get a characteristically philosophical discussion going. May I want to, you're another philosopher. Um, listening to what Simon Blackburn said, that kind of thing, or perhaps the kind of philosophy that you do, do you think it's of any practical use to ordinary people? Yes, I do, actually. I, if you'd ask me straight away what I did, I think mostly I'd say I teach. And I think teaching philosophy is tremendously important. Because if you have a lot of people who are quite accustomed to saying, oh, I don't know, I fell because somebody pushed me, or I did it because I wanted to, you, you can then say to them, well, you've said because in both of those cases. Mm -hmm. What's common to those two examples? So you lead them from things that are perfectly accustomed to saying in ordinary life to raising questions about what lies behind this and whether there is anything common between those two uses of the word because that kind of thing. Now I think teaching but people... Let's stop for a second. Hmm. Um, why do we need language over something like I fell because he pushed me? I mean, he's there, he pushes, I fall, whether one uses language or not. But if you try to explain to somebody, if I ask you, why did you fall over? and the answer is, I fell because he pushed me. You're saying something that links two things together, and the linking word is because. And so, equally, I say, why did you do it? You say, I did it because I wanted to. The linking word is because, and what the philosopher might be interested in would be whether these two links refer to the same thing or a different thing, whether the because always stands for the same sort of relation between things. That's what philosophers do. Bill Newton-Smith, let me come to you. One of the things that tends to bother most people at some time in their lives is what's the right or moral or good thing for them to do? Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of question to which people do really want answers. Uh, and sometimes they have the answers in their own heart or their own conscience or whatever, but sometimes they're genuinely puzzled. Is there any use going to a philosopher saying, what's the right thing for me to do in this situation? Yeah, I think if you want to think about any subject matter clearly and lucidly and come to the best answer you can, you will benefit from that discussion. Do you mean the, the philosopher will actually provide an answer and say, do X and don't do Y? No, he may draw your attention to aspects of the situation you hadn't thought about before. He may help you to see how your principles fit together. People often have conflicting views that they're not aware of, and through a discussion, they become aware 
that they have inconsistencies in their views. I mean, for instance, people often say that they believe that they, in something like maximizing the greatest happiness for the greatest number, they come across as utilitarians. We, in the trade, we call utilitarians. But you then say to them, well, if I gave you the choice of creating two different worlds, one of which there are 99 people, each of have two units of pleasure a day, and one person who has a thousand units of pleasure, on the one hand, or choosing a world in which everyone's got 1.95 units of pleasure, which world would you choose? Now that may bring out something that people aren't so clear that they want to maximize happiness because many people opt for the equally distributed world although everybody's that's, worse off. That's a lovely example of asking a difficult question. Hmm. What's the answer? I uh, <laughs> think it's time for the audience. I pass. <laughs> <laughs> Can I raise a question about the questions you've been asking? I mean, what kind of question would it be if you asked, say, a symphony orchestra? Is what you do of any practical use? I mean, people like music. They care about music. It gives them great pleasure and so on. People like ideas. They care about ideas. It gives them great pleasure to hear them discussed well and see them um, see a culture in which there's a tradition of careful, accurate, reflective, truth-seeking discussion of them. Mary Warwick, I think you wanted to come in. No, I, I agree very much with, with what lies behind that question. Philosophers tend to be philosophers because they enjoy the subject. And they also think that there is some elegance, beauty, truth that they like to come at, although they may never think that they've reached a final truth about anything. And this, in a way, is very like the activities of poets and novelists who are trying to see something from a particular point of view and explore it. The exploratory nature of philosophy is very, very strong, I think. Exploring is a process. Yes. And at the end of that process, you're in a different place from where you were at the beginning. There Can I pursue this? Understanding, <coughs> an increase in the understanding of the topic that you're, you're writing about. So we do have a goal, and the goal is understanding. Mm -hmm. All right, you're using two slightly different words. Mm -hmm. Mary Warnock was saying the pursuit of truth, I mean, mm -hmm. gradually and incrementally. You're saying the pursuit of understanding. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to know is, can any of the three of you give me an example of any time in the history of the last 2,000 years that various people have been doing philosophy of philosophers arriving at a truth which has actually concluded a question so you can now get on to the next one? Or are we still discussing exactly the same kind of questions that Greek philosophers were discussing two, 3,000 years ago? So one can certainly point to cases where our understanding may not have been terminated. It's not as though you say, right, that was the free will problem and it's now gone. But you can point to cases where our understanding, in many, many cases, where our understanding has certainly been improved. And if you tried to discuss, say, the nature of political society or the free will problem or the relationship between mind and matter nowadays, using only the concepts available even 60 or 70 years ago, you would just look like a rank amateur. Has that brought you any nearer what you might call in inverted commas, the truth about the free will problem or the nature of political societies or mind and matter. Uh, that doesn't, I imagine, mm -hmm. exhaust the list of what philosophers no, no, no. are thinking about. No, 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 no. I mean, I think these situations are too complicated to think that we're going to encapsulate them in something called the truth that we've written down. But we would hope to get a richer understanding. We can keep the same question. There are developments. I mean, if you take many questions, developments in the sciences are relevant to philosophical reflection. As the sciences push it forward, we've got to rethink the questions in light of the progress that's been made in those sciences. The sciences also give us new models to use. I mean, sometimes we try to gain understanding through using analogies. People used to model, a long time ago, humans on machines of a fairly crude kind. Now perhaps we can cast some more light by using computer models. So there's two ways then in which science causes us to ask the same questions again, new results and also providing us with new models or metaphors to use in trying to make things intelligible to ourselves. Do you want to come in? Um, how far do you take your questions? Because surely you can question questions. My own view about that is that a philosopher is, loses all credibility if there's any moment when he says, I'm not going to question this any farther. And I think this is one of the reasons why, when asked whether philosophers ought to work for governments, uh, the answer is, no, they oughtn't to, if that puts a stop at a point where their questioning is not going to go any further. 
I mean, the, the feature of a philosopher, I think, is to pursue the argument wherever it leads and not say, we mustn't think after that. Isn't that I right? That's absolutely right. That's why you lose all credibility in the profession if you become a sort of ideologue of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, Please. And you want to say there's a lot of agreement between philosophers. Do they all have the same... Does that worry you? Of, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but aren't we just displaying perhaps some agreement about what the point of our activities are? We're suggesting these activities, these topics that you take on are so difficult, it's highly likely if we get into it, into any particular topic, we might disagree radically sure, among ourselves, yes. but we are united perhaps in some conception of what we're trying to do. Do you think, looking at the world from a, uh, a little bit of a distance, that as the result of the work that philosophers have done, people actually behave better to it, towards each other? Well, I think if you care a lot about cultural things, including the kinds of values that, as a profession, we try and inculcate, that is, you care less about your immediate personal requirements and so on, that must be a, co a, a force for good in human conflict. I mean, people who are capable of appreciating the impartial point of view or the concerns of justice or the rights of others are apt to, I think, be less strenuous in their own cause, and that seems to me an important uh, force for good, force for coordination in human affairs. You, so seem to be, right. you seem to be to be putting it very indirectly. You right. say, well, philosophy makes a general contribution to culture. Right. It may be that indirectly, as a result of that, people will be uh, slightly better people, behave in a slightly better fashion. Why does it have to be so indirect? Why, why are why philosophers so shy at actually suggesting, or making recommendations about how to make the world a better place, well, or even help them? will help them, yes, but the novelist may help them too. I mean, poetry but may help you, I mean, music helps me a lot. It's very much a do-it-yourself activity. That's why mm. I think we want to stress things like the, the importance of teaching. We want to mm. inculcate certain habits, certain uh, questions, certain inquiries approaches. in people, mm. certain approaches, mm. certain Can theories. Can anybody do philosophy? And, and, yes. And then ask people, look, did you find this enjoyable? Did you find it enlightening? Did you find it helpful? We're not going to start and try and give an a priori proof that you're bound to be better off if you do philosophy. <laughs> Please. I, I Come accept in. that uh, an activity like philosophy may be worthwhile in itself as a pleasurable activity. Uh, but unlike music and literature, it's not readily accessible to the average man. Uh, it seems to me that because it answers questions with further questions, it's so esoteric that, uh, for most of us, it's just off-putting. Well, I don't think it need be so esoteric. I think we've gone through a period in philosophy where, where philosophers have written their subjects in rather technical ways, and, and this is a mistake. There's been too much communication by one philosopher to another, and we have to return to what I think once was the tradition where people communicated philosophy in the marketplace of Athens. I, I think it is an accessible subject, and the practitioners people such as ourselves have a duty to try and disseminate Absolutely. it more widely. Right. And that's what we thought we were doing mm. here. Please. But don't you think sometimes the average person does sit and philosophize and yes. sort yes. things out in their yes. own mind? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I think they do. Yes. yes. About certain yeah. certain aspects and certain things. Yes. No, I think the I impulse think that, is that there. does happen with an ordinary the ordinary person. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. But in yes. doing that, mm. do you ever look at the work that professional philosophers have yes. done? Do you go to the library and get a <laughs> oh, book of no. By a philosopher. No, no. no, no. But why not? But why not? There's <laughs> <laughs> great cultural references available to you. I don't, I, I, well, I'm not all that interested in it in that respect, but, <laughs> but I do work out, try to work out things in my own mm. mind, whether it's right or wrong right. or what mm. it, what certain aspects are against, yeah. against each other. But like now, when that. you do that, do you use what these people say are the, the methods of philosophy? Do you question your assumptions? check the rationality and consistency of your argument and so on. Well, I don't go into such detail, I know, but, uh, but I do try to dissect of course. one argument yeah. from the other. To see if do you think it would help you to be able to go into more detail and do it in what you might call a more rigorous, logical, strict fashion? Well, I don't know. I've never thought about it, really, in that respect. I've just sorted out of my own mind and see if I was right or if I, if I was wrong. Mm. Please, I think you had your hand up a moment ago. Yeah, I, I think it's a fair question to ask the practical people who seem to ask questions of the arts and philosophy. Um, what right have they got to deny these things? Because it seems that practicality uh, has taken the place of a lot of things in life. And it seems to me that music and poetry 
and the arts and philosophy have, have been around for far longer than a lot of industrial things. Um, so I think it's a fair question to say, well, these have been here longer. You justify yourself. And uh, it's not so unusual to be a philosopher or an artist. Well, what you're saying is you agree that philosophy comes into the same category as, for example, the arts. That is to say, it isn't even designed to have any direct practical effect. It is something on a fairly high plane Can't that help. human beings do and, you know, it's one of our uh, we, activities we, and we even we're tried rejecting to claim this uh, as a benefit the yes. fact that it doesn't have direct practical application in the way in which you're pressing. If you've got a craft that's ah. got direct practical application, then people are always pressuring. If you can make a better missile, there's all kinds of people around interested in influencing you. But having a craft that's not so directly relevant creates a space in which people leave you free, leave you free to develop theories to explore your techniques. And so one of the charms, and indeed one of the attractions of philosophy, is that by not having practical applications, we can stand back and hone the tools of rationality, the tools of analyzing arguments, of elucidation, mm. free from those mm. influences, mm. and thereby contribute a tool <coughs> to but the general But I think this gentleman had a... Can, a I, please, uh, can I pick the, up Bill Newton-Smith on one point? It was, it's a lovely image. You're sitting there honing the tools mm. of argument, and you actually say that one of the virtues of philosophy is that it doesn't have any practical applications, uh, and it creates this space in which you can be sharpening tools. There are people who would say, well, absolutely splendid to have sharp tools. Now, please, when the workshop is equipped, what am I going to make with the tools which you've sharpened for me? Depends what you're interested in. Yes, we give them back to you, and you, you put them to work. You go and think about these topics. What is time? What is justice? and see if you feel more satisfied that you've come up with a better answer. Or, or, or even is the person next door to me talking rubbish or mm. ignoring distinctions? I mean, just having that question constantly at your fingertips. A bit nervous. I, not, not in this particular <laughs> <laughs> uh, But there, there is one difference between philosophy and, say, music, which is, um, in my case, something I'm deeply interested in and spend a lot of time on, and it gives me enormous pleasure though I'm not a practitioner. But there is a difference between philosophy and these other cultural things, which is that philosophy starts from things which do crop up in the ordinary world, like, was that a fair decision? And then you work back from that to thinking about justice in the abstract. It starts from things like, um, oh, um, what is the relation between what I think and what I do. I mean, and then you move back to the general question about the difference between mind and body and whether that can be sustained. Unlike music, it doesn't exist in a space all by itself. It exists in the real world and then <coughs> takes off from the real world. You start with the particular. And it raises questions in your mind. And you go to the more and more general. Mm. And I would say that. In so doing, you get further and further away from the practical, the immediate, but the particular. But then you come back, you see, into, with, with into your Bill tools. Newton Smith's, uh, yes. mm tool sharpening space. Yes, but, but then you can come back into the world where we started with your tools a bit sharper. And then what do you do with them? Depends what your subject is. If, I, if I'm a lawyer, I hope that I think more clearly about the law. If I'm a doctor, I'm prepared not just to sort of go on from day to day trying to cure people, but I may have some ideas about what the nature of disease as opposed to health is, for instance, in a general way, not just what measles is. Please. So. I'd like to ask a question about the uh, major changes that take place uh, among philosophers when a very large number of them uh, cease to uh, undertake certain activities and begin to undertake others. And I, I'm thinking particularly of the, the fact, as I am told, that about 30 or 40 years ago, they ceased devoting so much time to great major questions such as why should the universe exist at all uh, as distinct from nothingness yeah. or what is the good life questions that had had uh, involved philosophers plato aristotle and so on for centuries and began 40 years ago to concern themselves very much more 
with the truth or falsity of single propositions or groups of propositions. In other words, began at that time, if I am right, if not, please disabuse me, began at that time very much to concern themselves with the honing of tools and not so much about these grand questions. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. We might quarrel a little bit about the dates and the actual description, but. I mean, philosophy is difficult, and every so often even philosophers get discouraged. And then we go through a period of saying, well, let's look at simpler questions. Let's look more at our tools. The period you're talking about, I think, is a period in which there was a lot of concern with language, with analyzing concepts, trying to make progress. And I think we're moving out of that. I mean, I think it comes and goes. And one of the things that brings it along is a sense of discouragement and dealing with the big questions. Maybe we should go back and look at our tools. And after a period of that, well, we go back to trying to take on the bigger questions. And I think we've moved back now to a period where people are interested in the large well, okay. questions. I mean, it's much more theoretical now than it would have been in the heyday of the period you're talking about. But there's another great philosopher who was heard to say to a number of your colleagues in the classical English tradition not all that long ago, gentlemen, for the last 40 odd years, you've all been polishing your spectacles is the analogy of your sharpening of the tools. Please, will someone put them on and tell me what he sees through them? Do you think there's any prospect in the foreseeable future amongst English language philosophers that somebody will actually put on their spectacles and tell you what they see? You, you may think that the products we're delivering, that what we see through our spectacles aren't very attractive or aren't very interesting, mm. but I think we are trying to give you now answers to the question, what is time, what is meaning, what is truth? Mm. I don't think we're standing back from trying to give... What is justice? What is yes, a good society? Yes, 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 yes certainly. Yes, I mean, yes. after all, and what level? You, and where do people see? find these answers? In books which only another philosopher could begin to understand? In discussion. In discussion. And in I also think that if you polish your spectacles, then what you see through your well-polished spectacles depends what you're looking at. And there's no one answer to the question, what do I see? It depends whether I'm looking over here or over there. So there could not be one answer to that. Please. Sorry. It will depend on the spectacles, too. Mm. Oh, indeed it will. And that's a true philosophical mm. remark. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to uh, further the cause of philosophy yeah. and you don't see the main object of that as benefit to the world... We never denied that it was benefit to the world. We just denied that the benefit was to be measured in uh, the kind of terms you might think of, gross national product or something. The benefit, as I think this gentleman has put his finger on, is in living a life worth living, an examined life, a life in which you have some confidence in your powers of reasoning, you know why you're using the categories and concepts you do, you know where to trust them and where to criticize them. That's a life which, in my view, is more worth living than one in which you don't know those things. So it is essentially um, for the benefit of the world. Yes. That's yes. right. I think for, for the benefit of the people to go in on the world. That, that's, if you, um, whatever you are doing, if you learn to be critical of a, something which is well supported by evidence, an argument which is well supported by evidence and an argument which is not, which is just a matter of what people say in the past or something, then I think your life is better and more rational. To distinguish between evidence, what counts as evidence and what doesn't count as evidence, is a very important thing. I think whatever your subject, whether you're a scientist or a historian or just somebody playing golf at a club. I mean, I, I really do think that that is one of the things that philosophy may teach you. Looking at your blazer, I have a suspicion that you are still at school. Are you taught any philosophy at school? No. As a result of the discussion this afternoon, do you and I wish you well? <laughs> we failed. You don't have to answer that question if you don't want to. I think a certain amount, it, it's a good thing to stimulate people's thought. I think so. Good. Well, I think on that note, we'd better finish the discussion, though one could obviously go on carrying it on for a very long time. Thank you.